Hello, I'm Alex Mansfield with Manny Things, and welcome to another episode of Manny Talk Shooting, the show where I talk to individuals all across the shooting industry. We'll talk competition, self-defense, concealed carry. If you enjoy this content, check out our YouTube channel, Manny Things. Without further ado, let's get to this episode. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Manny Talk Shooting, the show who I talk to anyone in the shooting industry I feel I want to talk to. But first, let's get with the show sponsor. The show is brought to you by Go Fast, Don't Suck. Bill over at Go Fast, Don't Suck makes awesome jerseys, dry fire targets, and memes to entertain you throughout your boring day. But besides that, we'll get to the show's topic today. We're sitting down with Mr. Brennan Conaway. How are you doing today, sir? Doing well. How are you, buddy? Doing pretty good. This has been a fun one. I won't lie. Amy five five six is like got to get you got to get Brennan on. I'm like okay. Oh yeah. I finally got my off my ass and uh, hit you up. So <laughs> I slid in the yeah. DMs. Yeah, I learned a lot from her. It's funny because it's like you know it's just kind of another different world of cheating. But she, uh, I learned a lot of different like more tactical side of stuff from her. Yeah, has, has that actually a, a, been able to apply some of that into your? daily thoughts or uh competition stuff Mm, not really it's more of like i guess daily thoughts of like if in certain situations if something was happening like home invasion or you know whatever how to manipulate a rifle a little better but other than that um some like pistol manipulation things uh yes but not a lot to where i'm at shooting though right gotcha fair enough so brennan i know who you are most of the competitors know who you are, but probably the general population doesn't know who you are. Do you want to give tell the people who you are? Yeah, so uh, Brennan Conaway, I shoot uh, for Black Bullets International. Um, yes, GM and Open now, and may play in carry optics a little bit, make GM in that, and then go back to Open full time. But West Tennessee boy, born and raised, and been shooting for right at two and a half years now, so. Only two and a half years. That's crazy. Now mm-hmm. you live in West Tennessee, you say. So where is the line right. for Eastern and Central time zone? Um, so like you go past Nashville, you know, like an hour or so east, and then that's where the Eastern time zone starts. Gotcha. Almost to like Knoxville. So now, do you know people on the other side of the state who have to you know dealing with time zone differences, like for local matches and shit? Yeah. So like if if I wanted to go shoot in uh, Orsa, which it's like four and a half hours away, um. It's an hour, it, it, time changes. So, like, you have to plan in an hour before so you get there on time. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there's, I, I deal with a local match about every other month that I'll go down to, and it's in central time zone down because it's right near Chicago, but it's in Indiana. And I'm like, right. oh, cool, thinking it's the right being there at the right time. I'm like, the hell, I'm an, get hour, there early. an hour early. Yeah. Like, no one told me because, you know, I assume right. Indiana, not in a different mm-hmm. time zone, but I was wrong. So, yep. that's, yeah. I went down to what well, we went down to Tennessee for spring break uh, in 2021. It was fun, but we did del- deal with time zone changes. So, yeah, where'd you come to? Uh, we went down. Where'd we go? First part of the trip, we down, went down to Franklin, and then the second half, we were in uh, Pigeon Forge. Yeah, sweet. Franklin's really nice. It's kind of the suburbs of Nashville now. My brother actually lives just a little bit south of Franklin. He does a lot of construction work. He's been booming down there with all the rich people moving out of Nashville. Oh yeah. Got to, got to get that money while it's good though. Right. 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 That's pretty cool. So Brennan, how, how did you even get into shooting? Um, got into shooting a uh, couple of, but I turned 21 and bought a pistol and uh, a couple of buddies. We were all out in the field, just kind of shooting. And a guy had bought a dueling tree and we were all out there shooting and just kind of made it a little competition in the dueling tree and ended up was like well let's go see if there's like something to do with like pistol shooting looked up uspsa and uh kind of downhill from there spent a lot of money after that (laughs) yeah now what pistol what was your first pistol um it was the one that i bought to carry as a uh, springfield uh, emp9 single stack gun 1911 Mm -hmm. uh bought that because uh, the guy that we had went out to the field that like on the field he had a couple Nike and Elevens, and I just fell in love with them. So I was like, well, that's what I want. I'll carry this one, but I'll also shoot it in competitions, I thought. <laughs> um, ended up, we shot, I probably shot like 5,000 rounds out of that gun because it was just like, we got to practice and get good before we go to this match. And ended up going to the match and like, it was completely different than what we had thought it was going to be. Um, 
But shot one match. It was an all falling steel match in single stack. And after that match, I bought a limited gun because I was like, screw reloads and screw running out of ammo. So, oh, yeah. Falling steel. So it was kind of like pro am then? Yeah, like pro am, but it was not um, like set time. Like it was, it was time, um, but it was more like USPSA style. It's a match that's like 45 minutes from me. It's where I got started, super small range. Mm -hmm. Um, But they basically have like, ungodly amount of steel and they just set up falling plates kind of like in a raise like just like a uspsa stage but um super neat it's really good to like learn how to shoot steel i got really good at shooting steel off of like from that match um but yeah so cool so uh what was your first limited gun then um i bought a uh it was a rock island high cap 1911 and nine because i was like I got to looking at guns after that and I was like, Oh, I want to shoot open, but I can't afford it right now. So I bought that gun, um, and shot limited minor because I was always planning to go to open, uh, bought that and done a little bit of work to it and got it slicked up. Shoots really well. I enjoy shooting it still. I went and shot a match not too long ago and decided that I'm a dot boy now. I'm never going back to irons, but, <laughs> uh, it was fun. It's just, it's limited minor with a all metal five inch full, uh, link dust cover gun it just doesn't move so it's fun to shoot oh i can imagine i've got i think i've got yeah. a few buddies with that gun and yeah that's that's a blast even though it takes weird mags yeah it takes a pair of mags but i mean it's a super nice gun so it's not a gun for the pores like everybody says uh no no no. i mean so which this one's uh it's a custom gun mm -hmm. uh certain i don't really want to name the company because but they do uh slide cuts on it reliability stuff to it and do really good on it but had some bad blood with them so i don't really want to mention them fair enough but no problem there That's okay. <laughs> so brennan have you taken any formal training uh, for anything i have not actually so um i give like all of my credit to christian and uh sailor because like his breakdown videos he just put out a new one i'd highly recommend getting it but getting his breakdown videos and watching his uh like all his youtube videos that he he posts i'm really analytical with stuff so like i watch how he moves i watch how he shoots you know what his body's doing in certain arrays positions um but just i i did that and then i learned to incorporate it with like in matches and then that's just kind of how i got better i guess fair enough so yeah. a lot of ex a personal exploration then too right yeah well yes and no because um, I don't, I never really practiced any, I practiced up until my first match. And then after that, we decided that it was kind of a waste of time because we practiced wrong. Um, but after that, I haven't really practiced. I shot a thousand rounds before, um, nationals this past year, or 2021 season, but that was the only practice I've done all year long. Um, I might've shot like 500 rounds before 2020 nationals for actual practice. But other than that, throughout the year, I may shoot 500 rounds, just, you know, 50 rounds here and there just get bored at the house and walk outside and go shoot some so um but i shoot a crap ton of locals that's what i always preach to people um that don't like have a, a lot of ammo to shoot at practice i'm like well shoot as many locals as you can because there's no better practice than the actual match mm -hmm. and so i look at um locals which is kind of hard to do as a lower level shooter i guess is like to use a local as practice so say you're having problems with transitions. Well, the whole time at this local match, work on your transitions, you know, driving off the target, looking at the center of the next, drive the gun there. So the whole time you're really focused on that, well, then by the end of the match, you've practiced, you know, 50 or 60 transitions, you know, in a couple stages. Um, so that's kind of how I got as good as I have is just using local matches as practice. Mm -hmm. So on what average, you'd be shooting, what, four locals a month? Uh, yeah, whenever, uh, 2020, I shot four a month, uh, 2021, I shot like three a month. So, mm -hmm. but I shot, um, eight majors. I was shooting almost a major a month, you know, after March. So there you go. Yeah. That's, that's a lot of majors for sure. I mean, yeah. Some so this year, this year I'm going to start my career in aviation. So like last year I kind of decided I was like, this will be my last kind of hurrah to go shoot as much as I want. So that's kind of what I decided is like, I'm going to empty out the bank account and go shoot what I want when I want. Mm -hmm. And kind of had to try to have a good run at nationals, but there you go. So 
speaking of aviation, what are you going to go like be a commercial airline pilot or a yeah, private that's pilot? The, uh, that's the plan. Commercial pilot. Um, FedEx is my end goal. Um, I've got a couple like corporate people talking to me. So I'm hoping that maybe I'll get a corporate gig for a few years, you know, fly around private jets for a little while and then transition into the major airlines. Gotcha. Now why FedEx? Pay the most. Well, there you go. Hey, <laughs> but uh, talks, right? Yeah. So they pay the most. Um, I'm really close to Memphis, which is their main hub where they fly out of. Um, so it's real close to home. Wouldn't have to move per se. Um, but they just, they treat their pilots really well. Like uh, FedEx kind of has a bad rep, but like the pilot union is really, really good. So that's kind of why I want to go there. So what drove your love for, or desire to be a pilot? Um, so my father and my mom, both are private pilots. Um, and just kind of grew up ever since I've been able to be like in a car seat, I've been in the back of an airplane. So, um, just kind of grew up around it, but, uh, it was actually my freshman year of high school. We were doing a uh, in personal finance class. We had to make out a list of like your dream car, dream house, and dream something. I was a dream boat at the time. I was big into water sports. And I decided really quick that I had to make a lot of money to afford what I wanted. Mm-hmm. So I looked up careers for that, and pilot was one. I was like, well, I've always loved flying, so I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. So. There you go. Now, yeah. um, how's the schooling been for that? Um, so – I went to a two-year community college uh, my year graduating Tennessee in 15. They did uh, two years free, so I did that. Um, most of the airlines were requiring a four-year degree, but most of them have kind of dropped it because there's a huge pilot shortage right now. Mm-hmm. Um, FedEx is still requiring one, so I'll probably fly, which I don't have. I've got 875 hours, and 1,500 is the minimum to apply to airlines. Um, but FedEx is more like four or 5,000. So it'll be a while. And then while I'm flying, I'll go back to school online and finish a four-year degree out. Fair enough. Yep. And you're not colorblind, I'm assuming. So. <laughs> no, no, no. But, uh, but I guess like if you're referring to uh, more or less like the learning for flying, I do a lot of it. Like that's what I've been doing right now here past couple of weeks is uh, studying for, you have knowledge tests for each what we call ratings to get. So that's what I've been doing a lot of is studying to get my instrument rating uh, and then my commercial written test out of the way and then should have my instrument rating, uh, commercial rating, and then multi-engineering within six months. So there you go. So even though it's not part of technically like a degree, you're still edu- you're continuing yeah. your education. Right. So, I mean, even it's kind of weird. Um, so like once you get into, you know, jets and stuff, you go through a uh, yearly recurrence training. So it's basically, you're never, you never really stop learning per mm-hmm. se when you're flying because you're always having to get better skills at, you know, engine failures or emergency stuff. So gotcha. you're always having to learn. It's not always that uh, autopilot, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. That's why you make the big bucks is so whenever something like that goes out and that's why you're there. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Now, have you watched any movies that made you like, why do I want to fly? <laughs> no. So the movies make it out really dramatic. I mean, that's yes, people crash. But the only time you, you hear about airplanes crash or the reason why you hear about them crashing is because they don't. <laughs> so like, you know, you might have 100 plane crashes a year. Well, you have 100 car crashes every hour. So, mm-hmm. you know, there it's it's not very likely to happen. So and whenever like in the smaller planes I'm flying now, people are always, Oh, that plane's so small. I don't want to fly in that. That's scary. If we'll die, if we crash, I'm like, we crash at 35 miles an hour. I mean, if you ever been in a car crash, it's kind of the same thing. So yep. you're just, you're just higher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if I remember right, you actually had to go fix your open gun in a plane. You had to fly. your yeah. gun. Yeah. So it was actually funny. The guy that, uh, fig- I had a slide crack in Keegan Singleton and, uh, Talladega uh he he was he did the top end for me and it was funny because I was like I text him and I was like hey when can you get to my gun you know like I got a couple majors coming up and nationals was in like a month and he was like as soon as you can get it to me I'm like all right well I'm leaving work right now I'll be down there in an hour he's like what do you mean I was like I'll just fly it down there can you meet me at the airport he's like yeah I can and then ended up uh he looked up the shipping on it and overnight shipping which is what you have to do to ship a gun or a pistol or whatever was cheaper or uh, more expensive than me flying the gun down there. Plus I got it there, you know, same day. So morning to afternoon, I was messing with him, but yeah, I went, went down there. Uh, 
flew it down there, and then uh, I think it was 11 or 12 days later, went and got it. So, there you go. Quick top end turnaround time. There you go. Especially that would suck to, you know, have your majors ended or delayed because of a, a gun it going down. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, I can't afford, uh, all, you know, four open guns, which everybody has. I, I have my one Honda civic that I run. So, but yeah. it's super reliable till it's not the top end that was on it had like 125,000 rounds on it. So I couldn't complain whenever it cracked. So. Yeah. Well, we're not all Eric Steiner who swaps open guns like every other week. <laughs> yeah. I know. Like, Eddie gun. Oh, screw you. Eddie gun. Huh? Infinity. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we love you Steiner we've got to pick on somebody though <laughs> but um yeah speak I know there's everyone's of a gear core you want to go over what gear you're running uh so open guns kind of a Frankenstein it started as a Calhoun custom and then Keegan put a top end on it um belt is just a CR speed pouch of CR speed and a double alpha race master super simple uh I guess shoes of Solomon's and everybody's wearing hats solomon's are, hats or richardson glasses oakley's i mean i don't know how, how deep they want but but uh what dot are you using i'm curious on that uh uh sig 3xl how many have you broken i haven't broken any i'm knocking on wood <laughs> um i have two i had i put i bought a canic uh kind of out of spike for a guy that said i was only beating him because i shot open uh bought a canic and put a 3XL on it as my backup dot for my open gun. So, but I don't hardly shoot it ever. And I shot, first match I shot with, I shot in Crocs. It was the 4th of July. I shot it in Crocs and beat the guy. He got an open gun actually that week. So he was shooting open and I shot carry optic. So we swapped and I still beat him by, you know, 20% or something. And I thought that was funny. But, uh, yeah, so 3XL is what I use. It was, is that guy Tom Castro? No. Oh. <laughs> I, th- I swear to God, he, he was picking on you or something. Yeah, Tom, Tom's always picking on me. Uh, like Tom a lot. He he was kind of who gave me my initial kick in the ass to take shooting more serious because he saw potential in me. So There you go. Yeah, some, Tom's personality could definitely uh, be off-putting to people, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a big thing with Tom. Like, you kind of have to know him, but uh, the deal with Tom is, is like he kind of shoots you straight forward. So, um, first time I met him, uh, we went and shot a local match out there in Knoxville, Orsa, and um, he was like, "What's your goals in the sport?" And I was back whenever I wasn't taking it serious, and I was like, "I hell, I don't know to have fun." And he's like, "We well, might as well sell all your shit and pack up." And I was like, "Dude, I just met you. Who are you?" <laughs> and then we kind of had a couple conversations after that, and like I said, it kind of kicked me in the butt to get better. So there you go. That's pretty dope. So you have to know how to take Tom. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. It, and just from seeing his stuff online, it's definitely the opinion, the view I get from him. He puts out yeah. some good information, though, and he, he, you can tell he does care about the sport when you I don't know if you watched it, but uh, he did. He was on the very end of Go Fast Don't Sucks New Year's Eve uh, live stream and he was spreading yeah. some good stuff. So mm-hmm. but um, so everyone knows you're a GM and uh, open. What yep. uh, what are your kind of goals still then? You've, I mean, you've become the top 5% of the top 1%, so. Yeah, um, I would really like to uh, be top 10, um, obviously win a Nationals, but I don't think I'm going to take it off Christian for a while. Um, but I think top 10, that was kind of my, my goal this year was uh, top 16. I had a couple bad stages that, like, crushed me at Nationals this year. So, I mean, that kind of goes to show – how close it is at the top. You have one bad stage and you, you know, you drop five spots. So, um, uh, top 16 was my goal this past year in 2021, uh, this coming year, if I even go because of four days of nationals kind of thing, that's kind of going to hurt. But, um, if I go this year, I want to be top 10 and then if better, great. If, if not, then whatever. So fair enough. And, now you were you were talking about you were taking matches local matches as practice, mm-hmm. um, um, when it you was know, preparing for like major matches and whatnot. Um, so right. you pick one specific thing to really be honing on. I'm assuming for those locals, right? Yeah. So like, um, kind of after a, a major match, if I don't have anything coming up, I'll get into an exploratory or exploring phase to where okay, let me see where I can push speed at more, you know, with splitting the gun or transitions or, you know, whatever it is. 
then, you know, I take that and I go to 110%, see where I fail, take where I fail at, and then bring that up, bring my 90% up to 100% for that. And then that, that turns that 110% into my 100%, and then everything works out. Um, but getting closer to major matches, you know, the week before, if I go shoot one, I'll use it as more of a shooting the major, so more of a mental game side of the local. So don't really talk to anybody. I'm not cutting up a lot. Um, taking it super serious, being, you know, focused, having no mental mistakes, which is what um, I did a lot before all of uh, the majors this year and then my early majors this year. I kind of had a couple, and that's what I really wanted to focus on and got a lot better at throughout the year was uh, not having any big mental mistakes. Um, so the locals, like I said, closer to time are mental, and then after a major is kind of exploring just what can I get better at, what do I need to work on. You know, if I was at a major, I was, you know, taking three sight pictures per se, so I'm not driving off the target um, after the second shot, then I'd work on transitions the whole time. If I shot – like um, nationals, I had really bad uh, st the strong hand weekend stage. Shot it like crap. So probably my next local that I'll go to, I may shoot a whole stage strong hand, and the next whole stage shoot weekend because, like I said, locals are practice. Um, so that's mm -hmm. kind of my mindset for locals now. Fair enough. That'd be a good idea. I know we were on. I was you and I were both watching a live stream. It was actually last night uh mm -hmm. listening to uh two dudes and you were talking about you know using locals as practice and i think they were kind of off put by that because they were kind of saying the opposite essentially they're like ah skip matches yeah. and go practice but right especially so, if you so my, get, go ahead no so my deal with like practice which this is for me this isn't you know it might not work for everybody else mm -hmm. um but for me whenever i first got into shooting i had a practice buddy and then he quit shooting so then whenever I was going to practice, it was like, well, what am I doing out here? Okay, I set up three targets and I, you know, I run uh, L prez or something. Okay, well, now I've done six L prezes. Well, now what? Okay, now I'm just going to, you know, distance change up, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is. Well, I just felt like I was out there wasting ammo because it wasn't, I wasn't progressing for what I was putting into practice. Now, I could have taken practice more seriously probably and done that, but like I said, I leveled up through using my locals as practice. So what I need to work on, that's what I would do at locals. Gotcha. So it was kind of more like you were uh, initially in the beginning, you were missing that structure after you lost your shooting partner. And it was just mm -hmm. kind of like, I'm just ballistically masturbating on these targets and right. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so he was, he was more into like well, knowing drills, you know, this and that. So like, I kind of relied on him for uh, drills to work on whenever we got there. And then it was also kind of like, well, we were at the same skill level. So I had that person like push me doing this, push me doing that. Well, then when I'm, excuse me, when I'm by myself, it's like, well, now what? I'm, I'm just shooting against myself. You know, I've got a part time, but I mean, I didn't even carry timer. I didn't get a timer until I guess probably like April of last year. So, I mean, I've never been like a big like believer in timers, especially dry fire, which I don't really dry fire either. Um, but, like, people that are chasing part-times in dry fire, I don't believe in. Because, mm -hmm. all right, so now you want to do a one-second reload. Well, now you're just slamming the reload in. Well, what did you do during your reload? You know, you need to have it broke down to, okay, you know, gun comes down, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, and then people with, you know, 0.6 draws. Well, gr that's great if you can do that in dry fire, but go do it in live fire. You know, I can pull a 0.8 out, you know, 100% of the time if I need to, but I have a one-second draw to any target I want to. So that's kind of been my deal is, you know, all these people that dry fire and have, you know, these crazy reloads and crazy draws. It's like, well, that's great. Well, now go do it in a match and they can never do it. So, right. And like speaking to that, what crazy fast reload is like, did you see your mag? Well, did you see the point you needed to see? Or are you just yeah. getting lucky? I know. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I can tell you there's been reloads where I just got lucky, you know, in dry fire, you get lucky. Yeah. And you just, oh, it went in there. Cool. Right. <laughs> or there's even yeah. videos. I think I swear there's a, probably a match video. I'm like, that fucker went in there. Oh, cool. Let's go back mm -hmm. to shooting. Yeah. 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 I've, I mean, there's some that, you know, like, like you said, just surprise you. And then that's kind of, uh, Christian's talked about some with like him shooting 10 splits on swingers. And he, he talks about it in his breakdown is yeah, he can shoot 10 splits on, on swingers all day long, but is it better for him to shoot a 10 split on a swinger and then transition off? Or is it better for him to shoot a, you know, a 16, 17, something normal but you actually, you know, can call two good shots versus a 10 is pop up and then it's blurred. It's like, okay, what did I see? 
So like you said, you know, a fast reload, it's like, oh my God, did that just happen? What now what do I do? So you have that certain pause. So I mean, I've never prided myself on, you know, having a point eight reload or, you know, whatever it is, but you know, I can do it if I need to. So right. the only so, time it ever matters is on classifiers anyway. So Right. Well, yeah. Not not when you do freaking trigger for the new one, the I'm going to run around in the big L and shoot all these targets really fast. Right. Yeah. And there, everyone was bitching about shot out classifiers. I mean, this one's starting out the game yeah, the, shot out as hell. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, I forgot what it was to make GM for open. It was something insane. Um, but yeah, it was kind of like that one. You, you, you need a, at least a 0.8 draw and you need to shoot alphas because they're in front of you. And at nationals, I went in and shot, um, the first array, I think I had all alphas and dropped one Charlie. And then the second array coming in, as it went, started in the back right and moved forward. Second array, it was like two Charlie, two Charlie, two Charlie, two Charlie. It was like, and went across. And I'm like, why didn't you just aim this much more and shoot the center of the target versus, you know, pulling across and transitions and then come to the left array. And it, I had the gun up. And as soon as I saw Brown on the far left guy, I pulled the trigger. And I had two deltas touching. And I'm like, you shot two deltas on this target whenever you just didn't have the patience to sit there for just a little bit longer and shoot two alphas on it. So, so well, yeah, when, yeah, that that one, one hit, when that one hit your score, that was like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just I was I got done and I just looked over that. I'm like, what you know, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so that that's the kind of stuff that frustrates me now. And I tell a lot of, you know, high B, you know, A class shooters that are coming up and that are getting frustrated with stuff. I'm like, so my deal is, is a Delta is a mic for me now mm-hmm. and misses if they're, if they're misses on certain targets, they're okay. Because I look at them, at, which this is normally during my exploring phase. If I have a miss, that means that I'm shooting too fast and I'm not seeing what I need to see. So therefore, okay, well, that's my breaking point. Now I'm going off the roller coaster, but deltas, if the, if the bullets on the target, and it's a delta, that's a miss, no matter what. I get more mad at, at deltas than I do mics nowadays. Yeah, just because, because it's like you don't have the 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 eye, you know, you didn't have the patience to say, pull the gun down, you know, in the glass, you know, a fraction of an inch. You know, it's just okay, now it's alpha alpha versus, you know, alpha delta or delta alpha. So mm-hmm. right, yeah, you're given just that what point oh two, you know, that slight extra like a seven eleven doing a thirteen split and actually seeing the dot come back into the alpha zone. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you still do you find that tuxes are the hardest targets to call at, at like at some a certain point? Um so yes and no. Uh I think tuxes are actually harder at, cl- at close distance because you don't respect them. Mm -hmm. Because you're like, oh, it's super close. Let me just throw two on that because I can shoot alphas all day. Happened to me at uh, Area 6 this year. Uh, I had a stage and you drew, blah, blah, blah. And then you could either finish on this tux that was tucked in real low, close to you, or you could leave on it. Well, I ended up leaving on it because I thought that the stage flowed better to the right to left. And left on it. And whenever I did, I mean, it was out, you know, an eighth of an inch in the black. And I'm like, crap. So then I kind of started pushing tuxes out farther. If I ever did go practice, I'd push them out super far because my practice, if I practice, it would have been like 50 rounds, but it was always super hard stuff that was really fundamentally driven. And um, I noticed, which it kind of screwed me at um, nationals. It was the stage that had the two tuxes really far away. And then you had two close slashers and two steel and a open in the center um my dot was actually all four inches right and four inches high went to the safe area after because um ended up being my mount was a little loose but went had two misses on the tuxes out there and i'm like i called two alpha and i shot three shots at it because i called it a little um right and i was like okay well i need to put another one on so pop 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 and then shot the rest pop 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 and got out there and then i had a miss you know it was far right of the a and then a miss two misses out to the right and i'm like what the crap so I went to the safe area and shot, and sure enough, my dot was off a little bit. So that one really cost me. I had two mics on that stage, and then the, I had to. It was a double uh, stage with another uh, stage in the bay, mm-hmm. and had a miss on a little bit farther target that I called Alpha High um, and kind of High Charlie that ended up going off the target. I had a miss there. So after that, I got it squared away. But that was day three, and I was really pushing 
um, after that to try and make up some of those points and just clipped a nose shoot on the stage before uh, my last stage, like just, you know, breaking the perf just enough for him to call it. Um, so that one hurt me and kind of finished me off for being higher than I was, but Fair it's enough. racing. Now, were you able to go to the, after you noticed that your mount was loose, were you able to go to like the vendor area and re-zero? Or yeah, yeah, verify yeah, zero? that's what I, yeah, that's what I did. I went to, or yes, I said safe area. Um, went to the practice bay uh, at the vendor area, yeah, and shot and put it on paper and was like, okay, yeah, I'm off. Let me readjust, tighten everything up and got it, got it going. So there you go. Well, at least you noticed it and you didn't, you know, it didn't, too many stages didn't go down the toilet for you. Yeah. And it wasn't, and it wasn't like close. Uh, those tuxes were at, I think, probably 20 yards. And then uh, the other target that I called the Alpha Charlie on, that was a miss. Um, it was at like 15. So, mm -hmm. but like I said, it was, it was in the upper right area. So that, I think that's why I went over. Not making excuses. I should have shot Alphas anyway, but. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard though when you have uh, your your dots off by four inches yeah. in two directions, right? But yeah, yep. um, well, we've been talking about nationals a little bit. I want to talk about nationals a little bit now. Um, you, uh, who's all on your squad? Um, so I had John Orman, Eric Steiner was like my buddies. We had Clemente. Uh, they'll be mad that I'm. There were a couple other guys that. Um, Goodness gracious, drawing blanks on all of them. But those are kind of my buddy buddies mm -hmm. that I knew that were there. Um, and a couple other, you know, like I said, people that I didn't really know. Fair but, enough. But uh, not, a, not a really big squad for – gosh, that's, that's going to kill me that I can't even remember who was on my dead gum squad. <laughs> They'll probably cuss your ass out when they hear it. Right. Like, what the fuck, yeah. man? You yeah. got me. Was, uh, was Hammer on your squad? No, he uh he was on uh he shot AM PM AM we shot PM AM PM. Oh so. damn it. He was basic he was basic. It was uh him and uh Josh Yost and uh Jimmy Nortz or James Nortz. Um they all shot together and uh Chris Workman. Uh they shot together in the AM or opposite schedule and then they would come hang out with us. So it was uh basically most of the rotten boys were there. Yeah. Oh, well, speaking about the Rotten Boys, was that just like your group you decided to like yeah, name it that? Right. Yeah. It was, uh, it, it started in Area Six. Um, we were all at dinner and Christian's dad was with us and we were all just kind of goofing and cutting up. And he was like, oh, y'all boys are all rotten. So we just kind of took, took it. it and ran with it. Yeah. If you guys are watching the video version, uh, Brennan's got his Rotten Boys hat on. Yeah, baby. Representing right. and representing Hammer, baby. I got one of those shirts upstairs. I just didn't yeah. feel like wearing it today. Right. Well, I get weird gotta looks. Rip. Yeah, I got to wrap. But I get weird looks when I wear it to work. They're like, like, and I don't work in, I mean, it's an okay gun environment. But then they're like, why is the Indian holding a really funky gun? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I shouldn't just wear this one to work anymore. I get too many weird right. questions on this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was actually funny because uh, I've got an older sister. And whenever I wore it, she was like, oh, I've got to have one of those. And ended up, she got one, and then her husband got one. So it was funny because it was like, oh, I'm selling a bunch of shirts for John now. But yeah, he's well, he's got to he's got to sell shirts because he's got that honcho money now. Yeah, and then the uh, the Pablo Escobar one, the gold one, so the gold one that's probably not been shot yet, just sitting there on his desk. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, not what are the yeah. But yeah, yeah, so back to nationals now. Now that I'm remembering it, um, mm -hmm. what was your favorite stage about nationals? Ooh, favorite stage? Well, honestly, like all of uh, I don't I don't know what the zone one I guess um, stage one through five they were all really really good stages. Um, zone two was kind of fun. Zone three had like a couple uh, stages. Mm -hmm. And then I guess the like zone three, I would say my favorite stage was the really long straight course with the two um, partial Ipsic swingers. That was pretty fun because it really tested skill there, mm -hmm. but I don't feel like it was so difficult that it was hard more or less, which mm -hmm. it was, it was a very hard shot to take, but you could shoot that array a certain way and you could slow the swingers down a little bit or you could shoot it another way and, you know, really tr control the swingers to where 
you could gain a little bit of time there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would probably say favorite stage out of nationals was uh, stage two or three. It was one with the clamshell. Um, I, don't, I don't remember if it was two or three, but. Like, the, was it in the back right corner with like a steel? Yeah, yeah. That, I think yeah, that so was like two you, then. Yeah. Yeah, it two because three was in the next one. You both of them were starting hands touching. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so stage two. Yeah, I, I think, think I liked it because, one. uh, yeah, 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 mm-hmm. block one. Um, I I really liked it because it had a lot of different ways to shoot. Um, the back portion of the stage, you know, so and, and the front as well. You could either go right or left on it. Um, but I just really enjoyed it because it had some super like technical like footwork that had to happen throughout the more front of the stage that I really liked. And it wasn't so hard of shots that it made it like a difficult stage, but it was also hard enough to where you could separate yourself a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that was kind of why I liked that stage a lot. Gotcha. Now, uh, Oh, damn. Just, okay. And there we go. Now I remember what I was going to think. So <laughs> it was, some, oh, that's what it was. So actually the guy who designed zone a or zone one is actually mm-hmm. our MD. And, well, he's not, our, well, he's MD for a couple matches. Well, not MD. He's the range master for a couple of our local match, our Michigan um, state matches. We've yeah. Got like three or so. And that's Walt Pagel. He's also our section mm-hmm. coordinator. So he designed that, but I did hear a lot of, from people is that they didn't like zone one and they liked zone three better by Shannon. Uh, but so I, I didn't like zone three. I like, uh, so you had, I guess that was state. I don't remember where they started 14 or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, the looking at it left to right for zone, the zone, first stage there where you had the bobber, it was all right. Um, stage t- the second stage up there is what I actually started nationals at with the uh, 25 yard mini poppers. I-, I enjoyed that stage as well, but right. then the, t- the two like clamshells, um, the strong hand weekend thing, which it's part of the sport, you need to be able to do it, but just shooting strong hand weekend, I didn't enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, then the next stage with the two, um, you had three low guys and then two swingers, they were kind of at distance. I mean, it was a pretty average stage and it had some long shots, which is nice. And that's kind of what Shannon's known for is pushing the boundaries on some things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, like I said, the last stage with the two half eight, six wingers, it was pretty fun. Had yeah. a lot of running in it. Well, yeah. But uh, would you say that Shannon gives you enough to hang yourself on? Is that what oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you're so, saying it's not super hard. Well, it's not you know super challenging and difficult, but he gives you enough to, Hang, it, yes. hang yourself on. Oh yeah, you could you could blow through the like the uh, the stage with the two farther swingers. Um, I guess it was what were there eighteen stage? I guess stage seventeen. Um, most people started in the left, and then you had three low guys below barrels. Well, you could it was a uh, it was open a neck up and then a tux. Well, you could I mean they're right there in front of you, so you could just blow through point shooting them. Well, you know, that's enough to hang you on a two-yard target just because people are like, oh, well, these are super close. I'm going to shoot these like crazy. All right, well, then you have a miss in the black that you don't see because there's dirt and everything flying up on you. And then shooting the swingers, you could either go up farther or you could stay back and shoot them, which a lot of us, you know, opted to stay back so we didn't have to um, shoot a, you know, move, you take away, you know, 10 steps out of the stage. Uh but yeah, certainly there's enough to hang yourself there because you're shoot you you could either shoot a 15 yard swinger or you could shoot a 25 yard swinger or something. Mm-hmm. So I, I I like how Shannon designed stages. 2020 nationals was super fun with uh, a lot of the stuff he done, which that was my first nationals. Uh, the only thing that I really didn't like that he did was the uh, there was a circle. Oh, the glory in, hole. Yeah, the glory hole thing. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. I had two misses on that target and I was like, I shot like four shots through it. And I was like, there's absolutely no way. And I ended up having uh, two misses on the target. I'm like, it's a bobber target after it's first bob, it stays in the window. And I'm like, no way. So it was, it was crazy, but that was the only thing that I didn't like. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Now, uh, if you could change, oh, I'm sorry, not let's go back. Um, 
Is there anything you didn't like about nationals? Like other than maybe some stages that you'd probably want to redo? Uh, not really. Um, nationals was, it was decent this year. Uh, not a lot that I saw that like was just out of the, you know, out of the ordinary, I guess, for the sport. Um, but no, I don't really know, to be honest. So there's not a lot that, I mean, which I don't look at the sport as some people do lately, especially. Um, I just show up and I shoot. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of my mindset is like, all right, well, this is what I'm given. So this is what I'm going to take. And I know people put a lot of time and effort into what they're doing for these matches. So I don't really, you know, gripe about it, a lot of stuff. So, mm -hmm. like I said, I don't think I don't think there's a lot that I didn't or disliked about nationals. Fair enough. Now, are you – I don't know what camp you're in on this one about uh, competitors not resetting. Oh, I'm 100% don't reset. Mm -hmm. Competitors yeah. shouldn't. 100%. Uh, yeah. So, it's, it's obviously a competitive advantage to not have to reset. So, like, a lot of the matches down here where I'm, I shoot at is um, staff resets, which it flows better. You don't have, like um, – pre-pasting or you know dirty kind of pasting where can, you have a really good run in a competitor pace and then you have to reshoot um you kind of live in, eliminate a lot of that which georgia state i don't think the md's uh doing it anymore but people that have shot georgia state will understand they do a 10 stage major and they do it half day formats because they're so efficient with their staff and how the the match flows that you can shoot 10 stages from 745 and you're done at 12. So I think I really like the uh, the the staff reset. Mm -hmm. Now you don't feel like you get necessarily bored, or you don't get like lose energy from sitting there all no. day and having to reset. Uh, uh. So it's actually really neat because the local match that's right 15 minutes down the road for me is uh, staff pace as well. Um, you can show up at nine o'clock and shoot the match for free. Or you show up at 12 o'clock and pay for the match. But if you shot the match for free, then you stay and you work the match. It's uh, it's really neat what they got going. Um, the deal with getting bored is I don't think so because you can – it's not more or less that you're bored. It's more or less that you're off your feet. So, mm -hmm. you know, you think even at locals, you're on your feet for, you know, four or five hours straight versus, you know, at majors, you're on your feet for all day long. So I think that it's more of an advantage for us as competitors that are going to shoot the match um, that we have the, the option to not paste and to, you know, kind of sit down and relax, which I go help anyway if I can. Um, mm -hmm. And if some of the ROs are, you know, if I'm, like you said, if you're bored, then you feel like, hey, let me get some pacers and I'll go help. And some ROs and staff are like, okay, great. And then others are like, no, this is our job you know, just relax. So mm -hmm. it kind of depends. Um, but I enjoy the majors that, you know, aren't um, self-pasting. Fair enough. Yeah, and I was talking to the other day, uh, this that episode will air soon. The He was the MD for South Carolina state match. Mm -hmm. so they also yeah, so that, that was also – Competitive mm -hmm. reset. So it'll be nice maybe some MDs for level twos and up will figure out how to do it. It seems like just adding one or two staff per bay will get you. Yeah. What you need. Uh, which, I mean, it's hard enough to get staff, but I think the big thing is um, if you charge a little bit more money, but it's not going to be a, you know, competitor reset match, people are going to pay that money. That's mm -hmm. like, um, I believe that every major match should have waterproof targets, no matter if you're in the desert. You know, I don't think that anybody should have to shoot bags, you know, charge an extra 20 bucks on top of the match and you've covered your, you know, your waterproof targets, your waterproof pasters and whatever else. Um, that's my outlook on that. And I don't think anyone would complain to not have to ever shoot bags because say you you're shooting AM, PM, AM, well, AM it's raining, but PM it's not. Well, now PM has an advantage over the AM because they didn't have to shoot bags. Um, so mm -hmm. I think more of the competitive side of it, more at the top level, is um, with shooting the bags or not shooting the bags versus, you know, you, you're having a reset or you're not reset. And it's just kind of all revolves around, I guess, more or less how 
much you want to put into the sport or put in to how well you want to do more or less. So fair enough. And yeah, competitive yeah. equity for sure. Like yeah, uh, swingers and movers. If they're, if every target's a waterproof target, you don't have to worry about it. I mean, I know Leif up in Kentucky built mm-hmm. set things to put o- over his movers. So they're yeah, always yeah. protected. So you didn't have to worry about rain or crappy yeah. weather for yeah. activators like that. Yeah, I've got actually a very limited edition Leif holster. Oh, that's pretty dope. That's pink as hell. <laughs> yeah, I told you, which the deal, going back to the deal with my carry optics di- thing was uh, I wanted to be into carry optics, like rig everything for 1500 bucks, And I've still got like $300 to go to even get to that. But so I got the Canic with the dot and then the I got one of the nicest holsters you can get. So. I, I thought it was funny that I got into it really cheap, but I would told Leif, I was like, I'm being obnoxious for this like division. I said, I want the brightest holster you can do. He's like, well, I can do this neon green. I'm like, he said neon green and pink. And I was like, no, I'll do it backwards. That way it can be even brighter. Like, All right. So mm-hmm. that's what yeah. I got. <laughs> I agree. Uh, every other holster, uh, no offense to anyone who runs a holster company, but y'all should go out of business because your product can't beat a GX vice holster. Yeah. But, so worth the wait even though he's a one-man shop. So worth the wait. Yeah. I think he had – it was funny, which I wasn't in any kind of rush to get it, but it was like he told me uh, like four or six weeks or something. It ended up being like 10. I was like, dang, Leif, but it was all right. Because like I said, I wasn't in a rush for it. But he he helps out a lot of people that – like if they – if say their holster breaks or something, I know that he helps a lot of people out with like kind of rushing them to get stuff done for them. So mm-hmm. really good guy. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, at some point we'll get Leif on the show and we'll have a good time. So, uh, Oh, speaking of, tw- you said something about 2022 nationals being four days long. Mm-hmm. Um, are you against it? It seems like, or is it like, too, do you think it's too much time away? Yeah, I think that I'm not really against it, but I mean, the deal is you're four days away. So you, you, you got a day for travel before mm-hmm. you've got a day to walk stages and then you've got three days of shooting, and then you got a day, you know, depending on, you know, whatever, you got a day to travel back home. So you're basically looking at six to seven days of being gone. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, how many people want to take off a week from work to go shoot, you know, nationals? Well, so. think about it. Staff is even worse. It's like 10 to 11 days. Oh, yeah. 100%. 100%. So, yeah, yeah I don't, I don't, I don't really agree with that. I think that it should, they should stick to three days. Um, but I don't North, know. Maybe it'll work out. I don't know. 2020, what, what did they say? 22 stages or something like that? Or 20? yeah, is there 26 or I don't, it wasn't, it was insane how many stages. It's like, just take out some stages, you know, um, you don't have to have as many days, but. Mm-hmm. You, but I would definitely know. think, I know people's criticisms of 2021 was not enough stages or not enough bays. So they yeah. probably, they kind of go together. So if you cut it kind of down the middle. Yeah, I think that um, there wasn't – I think 18 to 20 stages is right for nationals. Um, the Bay situation, uh, whatever, I think that the biggest, like, hang-up was on in zone three with the uh, the double clam and then the uh, strong hand weekend stage was that you basically had three stages in one because you had two strings on the strong hand weekend. So you have three make readies in the same bay, which really, like, it got caught up all the time there. So I think that that was kind of the only major flaw for that. And there was uh, there were two stages in zone or two bays in zone two that had two stages in them. And there really wasn't any backup there just because it was, you know, you had a make ready here, they shoot, and then you don't score, make ready here, you shoot, and then you go score together. So the, it really flowed a lot better. But then whenever you have a, you know, three make readies, then I think that that's where it got hung up at. Yeah, and I think I even remember Shannon admitting, like, oops, that was my bad. You know, didn't mm-hmm. think about three make ready processes. You know, that's right. That's four, that's four to five minutes in just make readies. That you're right. Making. Yeah. Because especially with these GMs that take six minutes in their make ready. So, yeah, I mean, I got a pro grip before the stage. And then right before <laughs> I go up there, I got a pro grip again. Yeah. Blow on my, shake my hands, blow them out. Oh, I, I'm not I'm not making fun of anybody in particular. I'm just, it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. I haven't had to use, I, 
I kind of didn't want to use that because I've always felt that it was more of a band aid for everything. And then you kind of become like relying on it. Um, but actually I started, I got a, uh, a rosin ball that I use whenever I used to bowl a lot. Mm-hmm. And I started using that and that's more what I use now because, and it doesn't leave all the white shit all over your hands and on your gun and everywhere else. So I kind of started using that, but I think I'll probably experiment with some pro grips this year, just because it is kind of an advantage to have your hands super, super dry. Yeah. Um, no, the bolt, but, the rosin ball, is it just, it just gets a little bit of the moisture out, right? Or, uh, I mean, it leaves just a little bit of like chalk on your hands. Um, but it's, it's super fine that like you don't ever see it, but yeah, so it dries out my hands a lot. Um, normally I'll take a rag and I've got a, a dry rag that I always wipe hands with. And then I'll hit the rosin bag for a little bit before I go up. And then right as I'm about to walk up to make ready, then I throw it in my bag and go up there. So Mm -hmm. I have seen somebody, I've seen a couple shooters around here with the little, with the the little pouch thing that they pat around on their hands. And yeah, that's, that's basically it's just a little bitty round ball full Mm -hmm. of rosin. Gotcha. Yeah. I might actually look into that myself, you know, because sometimes I use it. I honestly, I think I use pro grip more just to get one rid of the moisture and two, kind of protect the hands. I put one of those wicked, nasty, like super aggressive grip tapes, like stair tread tape mm-hmm. on, on my, on my carry optics gun. It's, right. so it's almost like a Chile grip, like the really mm-hmm. aggressive or, or the Chile. Well, yeah, it's a Chile or the, yeah. the Phoenix Trinity grip that are right. super like aggressive. And it's like, I just use it to kind of keep my, my hands safe. I mean, they're not baby yeah. hands, but God, I mean, <laughs> a whole day of you know running the gun that definitely fuck yeah your hands up. for sure for sure for sure now um you were talking about visualizations back when we were talking about nationals just a little bit ago um mm-hmm. when you and your visualizations like how detailed do you get in your visualizations um so back whenever uh like being a class kind of shooting my visualization was okay what do I need to like what targets are where? So it's like, okay, well, you just kind of close your eyes and you're like, okay, I got to go here and shoot two targets, here, shoot four targets, here, shoot here. And now more of visualization is, okay, I'm coming to this spot and I'm picking a certain spot. My feet need to be in this. And then I'm seeing A's every single time. Two alpha on here, two alpha on here, transition, two alpha, two alpha, two alpha. So I'm looking at alphas and then I really break down footwork in the stages to, you know, what's going to give me the most efficient entrance or exit or how I need to like stall throughout the middle of this array or, you know, whatever. So I kind of like beat that into visualization now. And it's almost to the point where I can close my eyes and I can see a colored picture of the stage, how it sits on the ground and how I can, how I'm moving through it. So it gets really detailed now. Very detailed now. Now, are you super like when you're worried, I know you said you're looking at the spot and that's where your foot needs to be. Are you mm-hmm. then worried about like, I'm leaving this position. So then I'm focusing on say my left leg has to go for, are you visualizing like that kind uh, of detail, like super so, finite like that or not necessarily? Uh, yes and no. So it's kind of come down to like, I've been super athletic my whole life. So stuff just kind of happens to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, but the way Christian has kind of talked about a lot of different things is you have a copy and paste method. So you have, coming into this position and you're going to leave with a, uh, you know, your right foot leaves first and then your left foot drags, or, you know, if you're doing a short shuffle, a step slide. Okay. Well then you have those movements programmed into your head and you say, okay, when I'm leaving this position to, you know, go from this, you know, a four foot slide for me as a step slide to come into a window or something from an outside of a wall. Okay. Well, I know whenever I leave here, I need to step slide over. So therefore it doesn't really, it's not mental. It's just subconscious. So mm-hmm. it just happens. So, right. So maybe in your visualization, you're saying, all right, it's a step slide here, mm-hmm. but you're not like, yeah. okay, the left foot's got to go or right foot. Or- um, it, it really depends on the stage. Like some mm-hmm. stages that, um, you know, have like a, uh, stage three at nationals had that super, like you had to hit a spot perfectly to see a target through two or three different walls. Mm-hmm. So therefore, um, it wasn't really the, it was, it was a lot of movement because it was a, uh, a short shuffle. Um, but I knew that my eyes had to pick up a certain spot on the wall to get my feet to come to a certain, you know, get to a certain spot Mm -hmm. to where I could see through to get this long shot. Um, so there's sometimes that like, I have to be really detailed of what I need to be doing with my movement. 
But most of the time, it's like I said, it's just kind of copy paste movements and it just kind of happens. So. Gotcha. Makes sense. But uh, all right, cool. Now that was a good thing. Now I do want to get to listener questions because I did get a few. Um, yeah. Pardon my French when I asked this one, but why did me, his... I'm going to mute for just a second. My right. drink, so it's not a lot of ice, but you can go ahead and ask. All right, cool, cool. So why did his dumbass cut his hair? <laughs> all right, so the hair cutting was... Uh... My dad absolutely hated it the whole time that I had it long. And, um, but I told him whenever, every time he'd asked me when I was going to get a haircut, I always told him it was another month every time he asked. Well, he mm-hmm. asked me, you know, almost every other day when I was getting a haircut. So it ended up, it was kind of for that. But then I kind of got known for having long hair in the shooting sport. So I kind of kept it long for that. But the reason I cut it was, um, through the aviation stuff it's kind of you got to be professional so i needed a little bit better haircut but so it's kind of more career driven fair enough anything. but they won't allow you to have a man bun i mean i'm i'm probably never gonna do a man bun just because that's not been my thing my thing was more of the mullet so mm-hmm. i mean you know chris arache don't you he, he, yeah i like chris a lot yeah i, I shot with him in uh kentucky yeah, he's a good dude. He's local to yeah. localish to me. He's bio. Yeah, two hours I think away. I think whenever you said something about the the MD up there close to you that designed Air uh, Zone One, I think he that's like his local MD or something. Yeah, he's and, very local to us. He's actually I actually yeah. just joined that club. Well, I'm waiting waiting on my phone call. It's on my note to remind them to call me because they took my money. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. But he he let me in on a little bit of insight, a little bit uh, like as they were submitting mm-hmm. stages or something he was kind of like you need to be able to shoot mini poppers at distance and do uh tuxes at distance i was like all right so that was kind of put into my practice schedule i practiced with uh joseph tyler and uh, keith tyler before they moved from washington to like 15 minutes down the road from from me so oh there you go i got some i got some training partners now so i'm kind of this year i'm wanting to practice a little more and maybe dry fire a little more um because I don't know how much I'll be shooting with job situation. So, yeah, that's fair enough. It's good a uh, good way to plan, I think. And uh, yeah, so uh, no, yeah, but man, I didn't know Chris had so much hair. Like, yeah, I always oh yeah, a little bun, sure. and then it's like yeah. Well, after the first match, it's like, poof, like damn, yeah. dude, you got a mane. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a uh, shot with him at uh, like I said, Kentucky. And we've talked quite a bit about um, his shooting and stuff and helped him out with a couple things. And then I know uh, Hyder's up there. I know Hyder helps him out a lot. So, Yeah, I hope Hyder's able to shoot a lot. In, well, a decent amount in 2022. I hear he's having a kid, so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, financial, financial uh, halt there for shooting. What are you talking about? That What are you talking about? I'm going to be like, we got you, boo. <laughs> Here, that baby needs a gun. All right, sorry to hear. Boom. Yeah. Now, here's another question. Um, this one's asked: Did you ever? Do you ever tape the downrange side of your dot, and why or why not? Uh, I've done it one time whenever uh Hammer was posted on his story about doing that, but I did it with a clear tape. So <laughs> no, I, I have not. I understand the benefit of it, and I've tried it a couple times. The only time I would ever do that is direct sunlight coming into a stage like like frost so, proof sun yeah like frost proof sun it happened to me at georgia i had a uh, two two or three stages that was just directly coming down and i just washed the dot out and i turned it up all the way and you still hardly can't see it i even put a paster on uh on the glass on one stage and still couldn't see the dot because it was just so washed out so i ended up taking just the black like normal 3xl cover and I cut the backside out of it so it's black in there. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's my occluded dot mm-hmm. thing. But like I said, um, I don't I don't use it. Um, Todd Jared on JJ's uh, live the other night or day, he said some he said a thing that really kind of clicked and he said, Why would they spend you know all this money on getting the correct glass and everything? But you can't make a precise shot if you can't see the dot on the target. Now, yes, you can see it on the target mm-hmm. per se, but you can't see through your glass where the dot is on the target. So that kind of like really clicked. 
like I said, I've tried it a couple times and it's, you know, it, it helps and it doesn't. But for people that are needing to learn target focus, I would tell them to do that, but don't keep doing it. Right. Um, it's, it's kind of, I feel it's kind of like a remedial thing or it's like you're yeah. having some issues and you're noticing it like in a match. Why am I staring mm-hmm. at my dot and not, you know, not seeing the targets and I'm getting yeah. bad hits. It might be something. To so yeah. so it's, it's super weird because like, I mean, I know I'm target focused, but I'm also dot focused in my mind. Like whenever I'm shooting a stage, like I consciously know what the dot is doing. And I feel like I'm staring at the dot, but I know I'm target focused. Mm-hmm. So it's like super weird because that whenever someone had talked to me, you know, kind of about that, like it's, oh, it's teaching you to be target focused. Well, I put the tape on it and I was like, okay, well, yeah, I can see it looks identical to what it normally does. But then it's like, whenever I'm shooting stages, it's like, okay, well, I feel like I'm just staring at the dot the whole time but I'm still at the same speed as if I was, you know, just straight target focus, wasn't even hardly paying attention. Right. So I don't really know. I mean, it's just kind of been, I haven't shot enough rounds to really understand that aspect of it, but I feel like I know enough about shooting a dot now that I don't think that it benefits me as a shooter. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that it would benefit people coming into a dot to learn how to be target focused or, you know, whatever. But I just don't, I don't see how it helps with you taking away visual cues that you can see through your dot Mm -hmm. because like with a three XL, it's a huge glass. Well, I can see targets, you know, through the glass. If there's a couple targets in an array close, well, I can pick up targets even with my dominant eye that I'm looking through the glass with through the glass. Mm -hmm. So then I'm taking away what I can see through there. Why would you want to do that? So I don't know. And uh, well, I don't know. I don't know. Did you listen to JJ talk to Matt Pranko the other day? Um, I didn't listen to him. I listened to um, Todd Jarrett and I listened to Mason. Okay. Uh, some of it. Well, Matt Pranko talked about a little bit about looking at the tube or, oh, you know, like people get sucked into the tube. I don't necessarily mm-hmm. was talking about referring to the dot, but it was like they're more focused on when they, they're, when they're dot focused. Or I think they're more staring at the housing. Right. More observing the housing with the dot instead of getting their focal yeah. depth beyond it, which which was really interesting to listen to and hear. Mm-hmm. It kind of clicks and makes more sense for some people who have. A- yeah, I, I, I think I kind of understand where that's coming from. And I think that that would be a lot worse with like a smaller window dot, you know, like a, a Vortex Venom or Viper or something that has a smaller window. Mm-hmm. I think that that would that would happen a lot more there because it's almost the dot kind of thing or an RMR or something. Oh yeah, but I think with the bigger windows, I think that um, I don't really see it being that way. But you know, that's I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. Now this one's uh, this is also another Brennan. This Brennan asks, uh, uh, "What was what was the path to GM, and what advice do you have for others on the same path?" Well, I'm not really one to ask because, like I said, I don't practice and I don't dry fire, so. What are the, the things that people really need to work on is transitions and calling good shots because to have a GM classifier, you have to shoot really fast and really accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, so my deal um, coming up, I guess it was it was after 2020 nationals that like I really had a light bulb click and was like, all right, I need to use these locals as practice because it's match scenario. So what did I do at 2020 nationals that I don't like, didn't do well at. And I noticed that transitions were really bad and I really wasn't splitting the gun fast enough. So I had to learn how to do a little, you know, faster with that. I learned speed at local matches with going to the match and not caring what my hits were at all. I didn't care if I had misses on every single target. I was seeing how fast I could pull the trigger and see two on Brown. So I learned speed there. And then like, like I kind of referred to earlier with, you know, pushing that 110% and then where do you fall off and then bringing your 90% up to that hundred percent or 110 and then the 110 becomes your 90. Um, so the road for me was kind of, you know, exploring speed a lot, transitions a lot and movement a lot because I kind of made, uh, I made GM off of 20, or 18 and 19 classifiers. And then I had uh, two or three majors on there for match performance, which I was kind of happy with. I didn't want to make it off, um, be a paper GM. I wanted to do it off match performance. And I've done it off, uh, it was area one in South Carolina that I got bumped with. Um, 
But I think just using locals as practice. Okay. What, like, like I said, what do you need to work on? What am I really, you know, bad at? Okay. Well now I'm going to use a local to do that. So I, the biggest things, transitions and movement here lately. So. Well, there you go. That's not bad. So I don't know. I don't know if that's a great answer, but. Well, they they can uh, it, dive through it and yeah. figure it out for themselves. Right? Or, or just, or just message me and or we can have a phone call about it. There you go. Fair enough. So you're still working on the movement and transitions to something you're still currently working on then? Uh, transitions are actually really good now. Movement's really good. It's more uh, – right now I'm, I'm going to have to be able to split the gun faster. Like that's that was, that's was that been my thing with watching uh, Christian's videos from this year and actually shooting with him a couple different matches was like, all right, uh, keeping up m- more or less movement-wise mm-hmm. – and keeping up transition wise, it's just he is killing me on splits where he can throw, you know, a 12 split on a 20 yard tux. I'm throwing 25s. Mm-hmm. So big thing that um, we've talked about is the grip. And that's kind of what I'm really, really focused on now is um, building a perfect grip every single time I draw the gun and learning to unlock different things through grip, more or less. Right. So now. Um, I think it's common knowledge now that nowadays it's kind of like you're not traditionally as you're not really requesting much grip out of this hand, your strong hand, other than supporting the gun and just manipulating the trigger. But our mm-hmm. support hand is like vicing, crushing, you know, super, yep. you know, pressing the grip. Now, how when you're going for that, I'm assuming you use a gas pedal. Yeah. Now, how does that how does the gas pedal affect that? Um, like hold locked down with the, the support hand? Uh, so gas pedals more or less aren't for recoil. They're more of an index mm-hmm. for me, more or less. Um, some people use them like, and I still use, I'll catch myself driving the gun down with it um, on close, like just hosing shit. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's more of an index and get away with, oh crap, I've got a bad grip. It's not, um, it's not really for recoil. The mm-hmm. biggest thing, um, and Christian talks about it in his breakdown videos, is your right wrist lock and then crush with your left hand. And he's been talking about um, using your back more. So it's kind of, it's more his info. So like if you want all that stuff, go get his breakdown video things. Mm-hmm. But um, that's, it's not more or less the gas pedal. It's more how you're gripping the, like, pressures with your hands and um Mm -hmm. everything else so and And having this and he does talk about this a lot like on lives and stuff that he'll do but having the same grip for every single target that um that you shoot no matter if it's a four yard open or a 25 yard tux you have the same grip no matter what fair enough no but um yeah because i was always thinking you know because traditionally you know i've got your four your, your your thumbs forward grip i didn't know how because, you know, the TiVo is really exaggerated. Yeah, 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 yeah. How that affects, like... Yeah, yeah I've got I've got Steiner, uh, Steiner, the range panda thumb rest. Mm-hmm. My gun, my gun's off at the spa right now, but I've got <laughs> his, his, uh, his thumb rest. I like it because it gets you close to the, uh, closer to the slide versus I used to have a uh, go gun and mm-hmm. it had the little wing on it that you kind of indexed off of, but now I use more of the scope mount, um, is the index point in there, mm-hmm. but some people, I mean, I've heard people talk about using the gas pedal as more of a recoil control, but I've never used it as that. I've used it more as it's an index point. Okay. I've got a good grip. I don't, or if I grab a bad grip or my weak hand didn't grab the gun good, then I'll start putting more pressure with the thumb forward to kind of help with mitigate until I'm in a transition where I readjust grip. So gotcha. Gotcha. Because I know there are some, I do know some open shooters who don't even have thumb rests right. on there. Yeah, so uh, some of the older guys that, you know, didn't have them before and they're more of a, like, a really rolling forward uh, wrist person. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it kind of comes down to that and what's comfortable for you. I mean, like, so this thumb rest fits different than the Go Gun. And then, like you said, the TiVo's straight up and it's just, you know, there. So it's just kind of, you got to figure out what works for you better, you know, experiment with a couple different things. Gotcha. Makes definite sense. Definite sense. Um, yeah. 
I know we're near, I know we're getting near the end of the show, but I do have a couple more questions for you. Um, yeah, sure. Now, if you were going to tell like one thing as your biggest aha moment shooting, what would that be? Uh, like to talk about earlier, it was the exploring speed. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a local with no expectations of winning, no expectations of doing well. I just wanted to know how fast I could split the gun on a target. You know, if I shot two deltas on it, then I shot two deltas on it. But I wanted to see how fast I could run a stage, you know, and actually have two hits on target. And after I figured that out, then I started dialing it back and shooting, you know, having to shoot alphas more. And then it become, okay, well, that's my normal speed. And then my next aha moment was kind of the same thing. Go to another match, no expectations, shoot it as fast as you can, see where you've, you know, come to, and then dial everything back. So. Gotcha. So exploration yes. speed, finding what you can get away with and what you can't get yep. away with. Yep. And people can even do that in practice, right? You don't have, you don't even have. Yeah. To do yeah. That. Always... For sure. For sure. Um, but yeah, like I said, I don't, I don't really practice. So I never done mm -hmm. anything in practice to that. I always done it at locals. Right. Um, but I mean, so, so to that point is, okay, well you could set up, you know, a certain array at practice. Well, you, you know, you could shoot it two or three different times. Well, every time you should be getting faster at it because you're shooting the same thing. Mm -hmm. But versus in a match, you can't shoot it two times. So you have to, all right, well, I have to explore and get it right here, right now, versus, you know, okay, well, I can start over and go do that again. So that's kind of why I like using locals as practice more than actually going and practicing, I think. No, that, that's definitely a, a good uh... – a lot of people could do that. And I know some people will, and some people won't. I know some yeah. people say it's blasphemy. I have to go practice, you know? Yeah. Uh, Which, and I mean, if people have the, you know, the ammo to do that, then great. Um, you know, go practice and go shoot locals. But if you, if you don't, you know, I think, uh, Brennan and well, I don't, I don't know the other guy's name that we're having the, Justin. the live last night. Yeah. Justin, um, they were talking, you know, last night, either, you know, taking a month and only shooting locals or taking a month and only shooting practice, you know, try that and see if that works for you. If you're only a practicer and go shoot maybe one local a month or one local every two months, all right, well, take your practice ammo and just go shoot locals, you know, a local every weekend for a month. See if that helps you, you know. But know that whenever you go to the local to focus on certain things, okay. Mm -hmm. Practice last month, I was, you know, splits were good, transitions were good movement was shit. All right. We'll go to this local and say, okay, well, I need to be doing this, this, and this in my movement. And then only really focus, you know, use the mental capacity that you have while you're shooting to focus on movement. And then your subconscious should be taking away, you know, everything else. Um, so that's the way I look at it. You know, now Brennan, what matches are you looking forward to in 2022 so far on your schedule? If you've been able to plan them? Um, right now I'm only scheduled for area six, but, um, cause like I said, with, you know, flying stuff, I don't really know what I'm going to be doing this year. Um, but, uh, area six, my state match and nationals is what I'm looking forward to. If I can shoot more, I would like to go back out to, uh, Washington state. They had a really good state match that I flew out there and, uh, saw some buddies and shot out there with, uh, South Dakota actually had a really good state match that I went to last year. They have USPSA and, in South Dakota? Yeah, yeah, I know. It was <laughs> it was super funny because uh, I was supposed to – my kind of long story short, my brother was dating a per girl out there, and uh, we were supposed to go out there. It's kind of like he could visit her, and I was going to shoot a match while we were out there. They broke up. Well, I was like, well, fuck, I'm not flying because I don't have my – you know, the, the girl was going to be the ride. And uh, – so I was like, well, I'll just drive it screwed. It's 13 hours, you know, whatever. So take off driving and get out of uh, – where did I – it was out of Kentucky, basically, and then get into uh, Kansas City and stuff like that. And, dude, it was nothing. It was cornfields for, like, six hours of the drive, both sides <laughs> of the road. And I was like, I'm looking at the same field the whole time. Get to South Dakota and, like, two-lane roads is, like, 75-mile-an-hour speed limits. I'm like, I can get behind this. But – uh. Yeah, it was really neat. They had really, really good stages out there. Um, I ended up having a really good time the night before and kind of screwed myself out of high overall. But um, quit doing that after that match. Well, actually, I done that at Kentucky as well. But 
<laughs> whatever. You know, stuff happens. Had yeah. fun with everybody. That's what it's all about. But right. I mean, yeah, that's why we do it. We want to have fun, but got but you know, you can't be like uh Jared Fox and drink a whole two pitchers of margaritas by yourself and uh be okay the next day, right? Well, that's what I you can ask uh Tanfo Timmy or uh Jimmy Krantz. They were all with me. We were it it kind of sucked because we were staying at this hotel and there was a restaurant with a bar like in the same parking lot. So mm -hmm. we didn't drive. So I'm like, shit, we ain't got to drive back. I'm just going to drink as much as I want. We ended up getting pretty lit at South Dakota. And then the next day felt like shit the first three or four stages. And then I had to make up ground. And like, after I started like actually shooting well, I was like winning stages by like 10% or, you know, eight, eight to 10% on most of the stages that I won. And I was like, fuck. But then I think I got beat by three points or something by some carry off this guy. And I was like, what? It was uh, Nick Walden. It was right before he made GM, I think. Oh, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, you got to use that. You can burn that alcohol off, right? It's use it as power. Oh, God. Dude, I felt terrible. Like, <laughs> I, I, I don't get hangovers. And I actually had a hangover after that that night. And I was like, this is not good at all. Um, and then Kentucky kind of did the same thing. Uh, like one of my first mentors that I had, um, he was like, Brendan, do you like vodka? And I was like, do bear shit in the woods? You know, what kind of question is this? Right. And so he, he bust out a, a thing of Grey Goose and like he poured me some drinks. I was like, all right. And then we went and ate and they were having, they had some kind of special on, uh, they were having like vodka, you know, vodka in a mixer for five bucks. Like, and I was like, fuck yeah, let's go. So got, got lit there. And we got back and I finished off the, uh, the bottle of vodka and I was like, man, I'm feeling good. I'm all right. I don't get hangovers. I'll shoot well tomorrow. Got there and shot uh, first couple stages really well. And then like, I don't normally get hangovers till like one or two o'clock in the afternoon if I get them. And one or two o'clock after lunch, it hit. And I was like, oh, God. Oh, God. And I just wheels fell off completely. So. So you need that McDonald's cheeseburger to suck up all the grease. Oh, God. It was terrible. <laughs> But it was after it was after that match that I, I uh, got sober until after nationals, and then after nationals, if anybody was there, they saw me, and I hadn't drank in a while. And as soon as nationals was over, we were celebrating. So well, there you go, the end of the season. I mean, you can't, can't got, don't have anything to look forward to besides <laughs> dragging your ass to the ho the hotel and the, the airport yeah. the next day. Yeah. So which luckily Talladega is only. It was three hours or something for me. So, uh, slept in at the hotel the next day and drove back home. But yeah. it was really cool because uh, I, I drove down the weekend before and watched uh, Carry Optics Nationals and got to see some people that I wasn't going to get to see it open just because it was close. So, but it was kind of one good thing about CMP. Um, it's close enough that I can drive or fly down mm -hmm. and it's close, but it's also, wish it was a little bit bigger couple yeah. more bays and then it'd be perfect but yeah exactly i mean for me it's only a 10 hour drive for me if i really wanted yeah. to so it's not i could i could drive it not like i'd want yeah. to but it, it could be it could happen yeah it's, it's always funny because people are like why aren't you flying all these matches i'm like well i mean i could fly but then i have to worry about how i'm going to get from the airport to the match and you know then i'm renting a car for two days and well then you got to get your gun out of you know you got to have a check bag by the time no uh, no no i'm talking i'm talking flying, oh, flying yourself yeah yeah but uh the deal, somewhere <laughs> yeah i mean like you just you leave it at the airport then you get most pay, places are like 15 20 bucks a night which isn't terrible but then you got to rent a car for you know two days and uh plane fuels expensive as shit right now um so it's just kind of more of a hassle to fly to matches than it is to just drive to them if, if they're in with 12 hours that's nothing so well, kind of. cornfields, if you're going to, like, North Dakota, just cornfield it, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, somebody <laughs> will get pissed at you, I'm assuming, besides the farmer. Right. You'd be like, what the fuck's this plane landing in the middle of a cornfield? <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty normal out there. It was it was funny. I used to work for some crop dusters, and uh, going out or up to South Dakota, it was like, you know, okay, there, you know, one, two, Five, six, seven. It's like, God, look at all these crop dusters out there whenever it's normally just one or two around where I'm at because we've got a lot of trees and not a lot of fields. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought it, it was neat going out through there and seeing all the crop dusters. So That's pretty cool. Now, Brennan, 
we're near the very end, but we got to pay the bills for the people who help pay your bills. So who are your, who are you sponsored by? Uh, Black Bullets International is my only like real sponsor. Mm-hmm. Um, so BBI, uh, I've been with him, got with him last year, continuing the sponsorship this year. Um, looking for any gun sponsors, you know, help mm-hmm. a brother out. But, uh, no, I've been with him. Uh, he's like 45 minutes down the road. So it really works out. Um, going to see him tomorrow, actually. Uh, but yeah, I've been with him. He's super supportive. He knows he's really, really smart on like shooting coated bullets in mm-hmm. open. Um, he specifically designed his coating for open so people could shoot it. And, you know, that's always been the myth is, oh, you can't shoot coated bullets out of an open gun, blah, blah, blah. So, um, my open gun was actually his that he had built um, to sh- show people that they could shoot coated bullets. Um, but the deal with him is his coating is built, like I said, made for open. And the way that it worked, he put it it's really scientific, but I'll kind of dumb it down for people is his coating is the high tech, but it's not completely cured um from him so whenever you shoot it and the powder flashes it cures it so that's where you don't have the melting of the coating so you don't have as much leading so he he went through some big scientific words and all that crap for that but to dumb it down i was like all right so it works out i mean it's super cheap option for people if they don't want to spend you know the 10 15 cents around uh for a bullet you know they can get them for i don't even know what his prices are now probably five or six cents around but Mm-hmm. Use my code. Got to be the hair that's probably not right anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right, but uh, I did. I did order some uh, BBIs when you couldn't get bullets from like Blue. Yeah, and that and that's been that's his other thing is he ships next day or you know day after it tops. He's always in stock. It's him and another guy that runs the thing. Um, but he's always you know got um, uh, stuff in stock. Versus, you know, like you said, blue bullets, you couldn't get them there. They're still back ordered six months or some shit. You know, you can call him and get them next day. So, yeah, that was the nice thing is the least. And then he'd shut down his website if he didn't have them. Like you, you wouldn't be able to order. Like there was no yeah. ordering and waiting. It's like if they're on there, they're on there. If they're mm-hmm. not, they're not. But which even most of the time, like the deal with uh, whenever he shut down is, like I said, it's him and another guy. Mm-hmm. And the other guy actually works for some other different people's, you know, every once in a while. So if like the website was shut down, it was just because he was needing a break because he's a one man operation or, you know, two man operation that's busting out, you know, all kind of bullets. So um, it wasn't really that he was out of stock. It was just, he was needing a damn break. Fair enough. And, and honestly, so, yeah, it's, it wasn't long. It wasn't shut down long either. It was just like, yeah, but it, it's, it's better that way. I think that's a good way of customer service and right. But as long as the shipping company doesn't fuck with you and take forever. Yeah, and that and that and that's what's funny is everyone, you know, is always um talking and if there is any negative, it's like, oh well, I ordered them then and I didn't get them for six weeks. Well, he ships them out the next day. Mm-hmm. Now, if you don't get them for six weeks, that's on the you know, either the postal service, but then he started offering a UPS, which is a lot better. But he's had a lot of damaged boxes with UPS instead of the postal service. So kind of do you want them damaged or do you want them uh late so right yeah that's definitely but it, but it's not on it's not on him more or less right yeah you gotta gotta remember you can't bitch at the the, the guy who shipped it already when the shipping company's holding on to it forever right 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 but yeah that was those were some good bullets i did end up uh a buddy needed them more than i did at the time so i just like sold them to him like here you go dude you need them more than i do yep I, my phone's at, my phone's actually sitting in a box right now. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> gotta gotta have that phone mount, right? All right. Well, Brendan, where can they find you on the internet? Uh, so just my Instagram handle, I think it's Brennan dot Conaway dot USPSA. So on there, YouTube Brennan Conaway, uh, Facebook Brennan Conaway as well. So. Yep. So guys, add him on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, f- subscribe to him on YouTube. He puts up match videos. I looked at that the other day. So, a bunch yeah. of watches stages and uh, creep on him, I guess. But <laughs> Brennan, I want to thank you for coming on. It's been a blast. Um, and yeah, I man. Need to, I need to thank the listeners for sitting through us talk this whole time. Uh, I know you guys are uh, following to the very last word of this show. So, I appreciate everyone. Of you until next time, get out and do the things.